Testing, hello. Awesome, how's everyone doing tonight? Yeah, so uh, this is my first time in Canada. It's about the only country I haven't been kicked out of yet. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, yes, I am originally from just south of uh, Austin, Texas. Um, if you're not familiar with Austin, it's just, uh, pr probably the, the largest city in Texas at this point. Definitely the most crowded. Um, I couldn't take the crowds anymore, so I kind of retreated. Um, but here I am today, so this is also going to be an interesting exercise for me because uh, typically I have a clicker and I like to walk. And so uh, I forgot my clicker, and so I'm semi like bound to this area. So I'm going to try really hard to, to uh, keep focus, but also remember to click. So um, if I mess up, just let me know. Uh, this is also a talk that's meant to be very interactive, so uh, if you have a question, don't feel like you have to wait to the end. Uh, a little bit about myself, I, I created Defect Dojo, it's an OWASP project for, for vulnerability management. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors for OWASP currently. I used to run uh, OWASP San Antonio and uh, a bunch of other boring stuff that nobody really cares about. <laughs> so, uh, a quick overview on what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Defect Dojo, uh, but that's not what I'm going to primarily focus on because uh, that, that content's already out there. I did it at AppSecEU. If you went to AppSecEU and I read the same thing, you'd be really bored being here. So, um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. The primary thing I'm going to talk about is my experience in automation uh, because I've seen a, a lot of talks on automation in the past two years. I remember back in 2015 when like automation wasn't even a thing in security. Does anyone remember that? Was anyone like around? That's so, okay. I see some head nods. The other thing I'm going to ask for, um, and, I, and I hate it personally, right? Because I'm just not that person. But um, raising hands to get an idea of like what I should and shouldn't talk about. I know everyone hates it. I know it feels a little childish, but it really helped me. So. Uh, Please raise your hand if you want to be involved on certain things. Um, but yeah, so uh, automation just sort of sprang out of nowhere, I feel like. Um, I remember in, in 2015 when all the, the people that were pro-automation were basically being told that automation could never do what uh, manual penetration testers do. And now, uh, maybe if you went to AppSec USA in Orlando, it's like you couldn't find a talk that wasn't talking about automation. Um, and then finally, because I am on the board, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of OWASP, what's going on at a global level, and answer any questions that you have. Uh, okay, so when we talk about automation, the, the first thing that I want to try and do is, is demystify um, at least what it worked for me, I want to give you sort of real-world examples rather than, than theoreticals. But um, the, the first thing that I want to try and convince you of is that you can do automation at any level. You don't have to have a huge team or program to go and implement these things. Uh, my experience with automation started when I was working at, at Pearson, which is a big education company. And uh, unfortunately, we kept losing resources at Pearson to the point that I was the only uh, AppSec professional, but uh, we had a, a very well-rounded team everywhere else, and I remember thinking to myself, like, this is way too small to be doing this, and then uh, I left Pearson, and I went to work for a financial services company where our entire security team was about five people, and I thought, man, now we're really too small to be doing this, uh, but every time I eventually sort of figured it out. And so um, all of you can too, right? Like you don't have to have a major team. You can be the only security professional in your company. And I still think that you can get some sort of meaningful automation uh, to make your life and job easier because ultimately at the end of the day, you all want to be lazy, right? And get paid and go home and, and not have a to-do list that's, you know, 50 pages long with a backlog that you'll never get to. And, you know, I still have some anxiety thinking about my backlog that I don't have anymore, but like haunts my dreams, you know, like, like nightmares. But anyways, I'm not better. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that I'm a very data-driven person. 
Uh, you can think of me as like Oscar the Grouch. I'm very skeptical uh, about everything. And so before I even consider something, I need to see data and proof that it works. Otherwise, uh, I, I just got something else to do. You know, I think as security professionals, we always have something else to do. And so um, Pearson has been gracious enough to let me share uh, some of their, their data that we gathered. Uh, so 2014, no automation whatsoever. Very strong security team. We did 44 assessments in a year. Does, does anyone think like that's a good number? 44, one year, five engineers? Five. <laughs> yeah, no, not very impressive, right? No. Uh, and, and it wasn't the team's fault. Our, our team was totally brilliant. Uh, there was a, a lot of red tape we had to deal with. Uh, but uh, overall, just due to, it wasn't the engineer's fault. They were absolutely brilliant. Uh, 2015, Pearson decides that we're going to pursue AppSec automation, specifically in it adopt uh, DevOps principles and security. We actually lost a good majority of our team that year, but we were able to increase output by 450% and do 224 assessments. And then uh, in 2016, Greg is the last AppSec engineer standing and uh, we, we were able to increase another 107% during that year. So, for all the managers in the room, uh, that's 840% over two years, which everyone was very, very happy with. That's a very fancy number, you know, if, um, for the, 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 the managers. And I didn't have a to-do list, which um, was a very strange feeling for me, being in security, not feeling that I was behind on anything, uh, basically, my role transitioned to just providing reports because everything was more or less being uh, tested automatically to a certain extent. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Is a good position? Okay, I never know. I'm going to try and keep it like right here. So. Uh, okay, so Defect Dojo, who cares about this project? Uh, me, I guess, I've been working on it for like five years now. Uh, so, it's, it's a vulnerability management system, and, and why I talk about it in this context is because uh, it's sort of the, the backbone of what I know about automation. And so, uh, you don't have to use Defect Dojo to create meaningful automation. Uh, I just like to give real-world examples, and it's the tool that I know and use, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. The other nice thing about Defect Dojo specifically as a vulnerability management system is that you can do whatever you want with it. Um, we're, we're BSD licensed, which means uh, you can do like literally anything. Uh, I'm very familiar with the problems of, of GPL licensing. Uh, maybe you are too, but, but long story short, because we're BSD licensed, there, there's literally no limitations on what you can do with the software. Um, I also hate new tools. I'm really, really not big on new tools. And so, uh, in, in order to, to convince y'all of anything that I'm talking about, I think that um, it has to be very, very compelling because every day uh, one of my colleagues comes up to me and wants to show me a, a new security tool. And 90% of the time it doesn't work, it's not well documented, and then I get angry that I wasted 30 minutes. Um, hands? Anyone? Anyone can relate? Yes, we're getting hands too. Sometimes you get like one. You're like, oh man, it's gonna be a long night. But uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, why another tool? Uh, Defect Dojo is built by security professionals for security professionals. The part is to remove, or the goal is to remove the aspects of our jobs that we don't like as pen testers, which is uh, reporting metrics and basically uh, anything that isn't hacked. Uh, but, but ultimately, if uh, there's someone that you need to convince and you need to you know, get on the business speak, it's about getting the, the most out of your program with the personnel and the, the resources that you have. Uh, and so Defect Dojo sort of fits into this, this larger OWASP project called the, the AppSec Pipeline. The goal of the AppSec Pipeline is to define standards and tools on uh, how automation is actually completed uh, don't, don't get too hung up on this diagram, but it shows you some of the phases that their project has already automated, what isn't automated, and um, where they're going to improve it. 
And then uh, what it actually translates into. So uh, this is the, the pipeline from Pearson that, uh, that myself and, and our coworkers built. Uh, so the idea is that we had an intake process where a product team would fill out a form. And based on this form, we would have uh, some sort of ideas of what we needed to, to test a, a given product for. And so we would take that and turn it into uh, automated assessments. So at the time we were using Stackstorm. I think they've since moved on to, to Jenkins. Uh, but so long story short, from this form, we determine what tools we need to run. Those tools are then run. Um, and the results are pushed into Defect Dojo, which uh, tries to combine the results from multiple tools. If you're a power user, there's things to help eliminate false positives, there's things to help remember duplicates, and then eventually we push that out as either a, a report or directly into the, the product team's JIRA. Questions? Yes, Tom. Um, so Berkswait's usually like a per person type of licensing. What type of licensing is there for um, like a pipeline like that? Ah, interesting. So, um, I want to know how much things cost. I don't cost. know if this is public yet. Okay, so yes. yeah, I'm, I'm gonna gamble. Uh, so, Burp Suite recently came out with a, an enterprise edition that actually has like an API and all this. Um, it was in beta for a little bit. Uh, I think it's for sale now. I'm sorry. It is? Does anyone your work for Burp Suite? Or? No, no, but I just checked today and it's like $3,000. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Burp Suite now has this new fancy automation thing that's, that's very easy to plug into. Glad I'm not about to get sued. <laughs> too. Uh, but yeah, great question. Thank you. Or uh, to, just to put it in another concept. So this is the, the previous slide was sort of looking at process flow, and this slide is is more focused on actual uh, code interaction. So um, is, it, is everyone familiar with Jenkins? Ra raise your hand if you're familiar with Jenkins. Man, awesome. Okay. Um, Raise your hand if you're a security professional. That's surprising. Can I, can I pick on you for a second? Yeah. Is that okay? What, yeah. What's your name? Um, Brenna. Brenna? Yeah. Brenna. Yeah. Brenna, it's great to meet you. Okay, so what what do you do? I'm not Oh, okay. Can, can I pick on you, sir? Is that okay? That, that's great. That's actually exactly what I'm looking for. What, what's your name, friend? Uh, it's Sean. Sean, great to meet you. What, what do you do for work, Sean, if you don't mind sharing? Um, I'm currently not working. I'm a student at the University of Ottawa. Are you studying computer science? Or Okay. Uh, it's, it's just interesting to see the, the balance of like security-focused people to, to dev-focused people because um, I think the other thing that's becoming true is, and, and thank you guys, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have put you on the spot like that. That was, that was embarrassing. And I'm sorry, I was just excited. <laughs> um, which I'll do great, seriously. Um, is uh, developers and security people were becoming much more intertwined because of the technologies that we're using. And in some cases, it's easier to cross over as a dev than it is for a security professional to become familiar with these tool tools. But anyway, so. Um, you know, one of the things you can do with Jenkins is know when certain things occur, like code pushes in, in GitHub, for instance. And so uh, to, to think about it in terms of tools, when a code change occurs, you could use Jenkins to detect that information, um, launch instances of that application using Docker, test it with a tool, push that information to your vulnerability management system, uh, do whatever sort of magic you're going to do there, and then finally uh, push it on to the developers. Uh, so, so what do you folks do now, though? Let's say you have the results from uh, a Nessus scan in, in Zap. Like, what, what do you do today to, to turn that into a report? Do they want to be brave? I'm sorry, <laughs> I won't just call on people this time. Copy paste. Yeah, copy paste into a Word document. Copy paste. <laughs> Anyone come on. No, for serious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. But so the, the answer I usually get is Excel, which just hurts my soul. Exactly. Um, 
And so the, the problem, right, with using something like Excel or, or doing any sort of manual process is that someone's entire job becomes keeping the sheet up to date, uh, keeping, trying to remove duplicates, right? So let's say you have a tool where there's some overlap. Um, you typically want to correct that before you, you put a, um, a report out. Uh, but also, you know, false positive removal. You have a, a very highly skilled person whose entire job is to fill out things in Excel. And that, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, the end sort of goal is for Defect Dojo to be a, a mothership of tools, if you will. Uh, sort of a, a hub to absorb all this information and, and turn it into uh, meaningful output. So originally we were doing something with Google Forms. We don't do that anymore. Don't worry about it. Uh, but so these are, these are some of the tools we support. There's new tools added on a, slow, a monthly basis. So. If you don't see, uh, if there's a tool that you're looking to have added, you can also submit a sample file and someone might eventually get to it. But, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty easy to, oh, get ahead of myself. Uh, but to, to explain sort of how we got there, um, vulnerability management for me was Dratus 2.0. Dratus 2.0, anyone? <laughs> anyone from those days? Oh man. What do, you, what do you guys use? See, no one wants to answer this question of what they're using for vulnerability management. Nobody's heard of Dratus 2.0. Just, you're looking brave. No? <laughs> okay, I won't pick on you. I'm sorry, that was me the first time. I'm not going to do it again. Okay, but anyway, so um, vulnerability management for me started in, in Dratus 2.0, and, and it is a great tool for what it is. Uh, it gives you some sort of templates so you can have reports and, and look through some of the work that's been done. But um, what I found is I was spending 60% of my time writing reports and doing metrics for leadership and those sort of things rather than doing what I actually like to do. Um, and this was the sort of the, the source of the unhappiness at my work was um, I was spending so much time doing this. Oh, um, and so <laughs> one time I was in a, a meeting with my leadership team. It's my first job at a college. Uh, you know, I went to supposedly a hotshot university. And I hadn't really learned how to keep my mouth shut yet. And so um, we're, we're in this meeting with, you know, VPs and, and the like. And uh, we're complaining about tools, like we usually do. And uh, finally I said, you know, I think if you gave me the chance, I could make something better. And so uh, probably because they were tired of dealing with me, they said okay. Uh, and sent me away for two weeks. And so... Um, what came out of those two weeks was the, the first iteration of uh, what we now call Defect Dojo. And it was a nightmare. Uh, it barely worked. It crashed all the time. Um, we had problems with our metrics around 30 days, like getting monthly metrics correct because, you know, uh, months vary in days and just all sorts of awful bugs. But um, the team was happy enough with it, or it was, it was better than what we were using. To, to continue on with that. And so it's been, I guess, like five, six years since those days. And yeah, so um, the other thing, besides demystifying automation, the other thing that I want to try to sell you on is uh, demystifying open source. Because there have been times when I wanted to contribute to open source, and I started looking at the code and the docs, and I was like, break out, you know? Like, <laughs> I didn't want to do it. Uh, so, you know, when you look at things like uh, OpenSSL, for instance, or uh, to just take your pick. We, we wanted to have some sort of pillars of truth in the project that would always be true and, and make it easy for the community. And so uh, the first one is to hopefully be well documented. We try really hard when a feature changes or something new is added that uh, we accept the documentation at the time that that new feature goes in. So there's never a, a gap in terms of what's going on. Uh, the second one is, is launch easily. So there's a, a setup script that supports uh, every operating system, but ESD-based systems and Windows. So uh, anything that's Debian-based, anything that's Yum-based, even works on OS X. Uh, we have Docker images. Um, there actually was a CloudFormation script added today, I think it was. So 
you just want to launch on AWS. I haven't QC'd that yet, so don't, I, I, don't, I don't know how good that code is. I'm sure it's great. Um, but it's brand new, and you know how things that are, that are new go, right? Um, <laughs> launching easily was the goal. And then uh, finally easy to change, because again, we, we don't want uh, people to be overwhelmed. We've actually had uh, high school students contribute to the project, you know, college students, and so it's, it's a very friendly project, even if you have uh, no programming experience. The, the most complex features come down to, to three files, and, and one is called models, which basically defines um, how you interact with the database. So you don't actually have to do any queries. Uh, views, which processes data. This is where uh, you, you take things in, so, so it could be scanner information, and you just uh, you manipulate it, you do what you want with it. And then finally is templates, which is what is actually displayed to the, the users through the user interface. Um, and even if you're not very familiar with like front-end development, there's a ton that you could uh, copy from. And you'll, you'll notice we do that a lot because everything looks looks the same in some places. You can tell like where the, the talented people were, right? It was not me. Uh, Aaron Weaver did completely like rehaul her UI. It looks much better now. Um, when I was doing it, it looked like a child. We do buttons from like web 1.0. And anyways. <laughs> oh, yeah, and so the other thing about easy, being easy to change is we're built off the Django framework. And what that means is you can use any plugin in the Django system with Defect Dojo. So uh, by default, you create users for login, right? But there is a, a Django plugin for LDAP. So if you wanted to hook Defect Dojo up to your, your LDAP instances, uh, you just install the Django plugin in and, and there you go. Uh, so we already talked about the future a little bit. But um, again, we're just trying to create something. We're, the, the true end goal is to produce a high confidence report with false positives removed that we can ship without any human interaction and do that on a, a frequent basis. Contributing, right, so again, super easy project, very low barrier, uh, looks great on resumes. I've been starting to see uh, like some, some job wrecks that have defect dojo, which really is sort of like boom. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, what, what else can I say to convince people to contribute? Just ask, them. <laughs> just ask them? Just ask them, or just tell them how they can. Like, so many people like, write... Like, each one? Like, no, but I mean... How about you, sir? <laughs> what, if, pizza. What, if, <laughs> what if you ask on social media? I, I don't know, Aaron runs that. I don't know anything to do with that. I don't like social make, media. Make Aaron ask. And then get me to... Delegate, read. that's what I heard. Yeah, uh, delegate. Me. Get me to retweet it. Uh, uh, resources. So I'll, I'll send these slides out if, if you're interested. And so this is just where the, the GitHub is, the docs, and the, the demo. OK, so moving on. Defect Dojo, done, out of the way. You can go watch that online if you want to. Now it's time for new stuff. So. Um, Adventures in automation. Uh, if you do decide to pursue automation, I just want to cover, I, I think, what are some of the, the most troubling aspects or the things that, that have given me the most problems. And so um, going back to these diagrams, right, if you actually go look at this and, and decide that um, you're going to make your life miserable for a while, um, the, the, one of the big challenges is, I think, authenticated scanning with web apps. Uh, does anyone think that they solve that well currently and wants to? Anyone? Oh, man. That's okay. I'm not going to pick on you. Um, okay, so uh, my, my original answer to this was, was Arachne, which is a, another free and open source tool. Uh, what, what really enamored me with Arachne and, and made me want to use it is because uh, it's built on something called PhantomJS. Does anyone know what PhantomJS is? Man, I won't pick on you. That would be good. Okay, so um, uh, PhantomJS is basically a means to simulate what actually happens in the browser on a level that wasn't previously available before. So you know, in the dark days, we're looking at like uh, request responses and trying to figure out what's going to happen. Is there a vulnerability? Uh, PhantomJS gave us the ability to actually 
interact <coughs> with web elements on a way that wasn't um, possible before. It's like a headless browser, if you will. It was one of the, the early iterations of the headless browser. And so um, I was particularly interested in PhantomJS because as uh, JavaScript libraries have grown, sometimes fuzzing them on a request response level can be very difficult because you can have uh, like multi-functions in one JavaScript function, right? Like where you have to click through to load something else and this, that, and the other. And in typical request response, that can get lost. And so uh, I was very excited about this technology, but um, I cannot get this tool to work right. And I have spent weeks in this thing trying to find the right configuration. Um, and so it, it may work for you, but the, the edge case that I run into is with applications that <clears throat> create something, typically. So think of like a, a blog system where you click create post and, and a new post is made. And so I think, I think what this tool is doing is that it sees a new page and it's like, oh, I need to go check that out. But it makes another page in the process and it's like, oh, I need to go check that one out. And so um, getting this tool to actually finish scanning has been a huge pain point for me. Um, does anyone else use Arachne? The, the depth configuration, right? Because yeah. otherwise they can't, they can't hear you. Can, can you all hear her? Man, this is great information. See, they're missing out on the great information. <laughs> you, you don't have to if you don't want to. Was... Um, so, for example, a calendar page, um, if you click the next on the next day, it links you to the next day, and then it links you to the next day. For Arachne, it's not able to figure out that, that's, um, that it shouldn't visit all those pages. So there is, uh, I can't remember the exact things, but there's two different um, configurations that you could use in order to limit it. And it's not depth, because depth would be like visiting um, one page after the other, after the other. In terms of a calendar, it's, the pages are not nested. And it's not able um, to figure that out. Um, I, I can't remember the, I can look it up while you talk. Would you like a job? Are you opposed to working in the states? <laughs> um, my thesis was on a comparative analysis of open source web application vulnerability scanners. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear no. <laughs> 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 we can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Please, please give her a big hand. <laughs> After you know losing some hair uh, working on Arachne, I then. Um, went to Zap, right, because of course Zap has to work. Uh, back in the dark ages of Zap, there was something called Zest scripts. Uh, and the, these don't really work anymore, they're just a huge pain, don't want them. If, if, you, if, you, if this keyword comes into your search results, if you're trying to automate, just, just go on. Um, the, the evolution of Zest was something called context, and uh, contexts do work to a certain extent. Uh, this is this is what a context in Zap looks like. Sorry, I know it's kind of hard for people to see in the back. Uh, this is just like a menu, and then there's a, an authentication option. Excuse me. Um, you feed it the the login form, some of the request data, username and password parameter. Uh, the issue I ran into with Zap context is they're they're too simple. Uh, so like one example is like uh, CSRF on on login. Uh, that, that was something I could never get past. Uh, if, if you're doing any sort of, of fancier authentication, I, I personally had issues. Uh, is there, are there any Zap experts in the room? No, ah, I couldn't get it. Um, and so I, I did finally get, get a result to this, but it's, it's commercial. And so um, I don't really want to mention it here. And you know, it's the boss, so I don't promote commercial tools, but... It's okay. Um, it's okay. You can just say it if they want to use it. Okay. Well, we, so, you're, you're not now, selling it. You're just like, I use this and it works. Yes. Yeah, some people still get angry, though. And then, like, they email me. <laughs> Is anyone going to get angry if he tells us the answer? No. Oh, hopefully no. they just don't find me. All right. No, just uh, so, uh, yeah, so I actually went to, to Burp Enterprise, as was sort of already alluded to. Um, they have a beta out, and I've been using that. Um, the, the things I looked at when I was selecting a tool are... are Results, uh, cost, and licensing because you know some of the, the licensing and security is absolutely insane. Uh, so originally I was using Acunetics, which works the, the best. Uh, I know I'm a 
the space. Um, but so their their licensing is just too crazy for me. And so um, we moved on to the Burp Enterprise. Container scanning. I know we have some container experts in the room. I talked to someone who presented at uh, a Docker conference. I ran away. I bored him to death. Um, but so beyond testing the actual application, if you're deploying with containers, the um, the requirements or the libraries that you need to actually make that uh, application run can also be a pain point in security. And introspecting containers uh, can be fairly difficult. And so for that, I use a tool called Claire, uh, which is very, very hard to set up. Um, it's just, it's just a difficult tool, but to, to, to give you a long story short, uh, this, uh, this person created a repository that makes it run as an all-in-one. Um, it doesn't work on any operating system besides Ubuntu 18. Uh, at first I thought it was a me problem, but it was just an OS problem. And so, yeah, there, there you go, there's a solution if um, container scanning is a pain point for you. Just make double checking. Um, yeah, so uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm just Greg Anderson at OWASP.org. Um, thank you guys so much. This is a really awesome chapter, and that's all I got. Thank you.